shadowed place I can't get enough of the sunlight on my face when it's cold and dark or I'm far from home you are in my heart and I never walk alone and just like a tree planted by a stream thirsty for a drink of your love I can't face a day without some time to pray I sing this song to say I need your love I'm a tiny child But when I'm with you I will not grow tired Cause there's nothing you can do Your love makes me strong Though I'm small and weak the whole day long you'll speak through me when I speak and just like a tree planted by a stream thirsty for a drink of your love I can't face a day without some time to pray I sing this song to say I need your love You gave all for me Though I curse your name On that bitter tree Lord, you suffered for my shame for a drink of your love. I can't face a day without some time to pray. I sing this song to say I need your We're going to sing Anchor for the Soul. Somewhere beyond the blue Now 
on my way I learn through each path I take every day I'm growing on my way I'm knowing heaven's worth the way cause when this day is gone Someday when tomorrow, heaven is our home. So anchor for the soul, shelter from the storm. Jackson, I'm new. I'm Sean, and we are out playing disc golf and just wanted to welcome you all to church this morning. And I wanted to read a scripture to you guys with you guys Hebrews 10, verse 23 through 25. It reads, Let us hold fast the confession of our hope without wavering, for he who promised is faithful. And let us consider how to spur up one another to love and good works not neglecting to meet together, as it is the habit of some, but encouraging one another, and all the more as you see the day drawing near. I think it's great, it's beautiful that we're all out here today, and it's sunny, it's not that cold, the wind's blowing just a little bit, we're playing disc golf, having a great time, and it's awesome because we're fellowshipping with one another. We're here, and we haven't made it a habit to not meet up together, it's a it's a Thursday currently as we're recording this. So there's no church today, no midweek, no family de Friday devotional. It's a Thursday. Who does stuff on Thursday? God's people. Mm. And so we're actually fellowshipping with one another and it's really amazing. And now Jackson's gonna share something. Yeah, that's right. So um, I've uh, been studying the Bible recently. I'm kind of new to it. Uh, and I'm especially thankful for these guys, including Rich who's holding the camera because they've been helping me uh, keep track and really keep moving with uh, my studying and understanding what God, God's plan is for me. So um, something that I kind of thought of when Scripture was, for God so loved the earth, He gave His one and only Son, and uh, now we got disc golf. So we can enjoy it <laughs> That's all I got. Disc golf. Yeah. yeah, and I think it's just so cool. We're actually using Miko's disc golf discs, so... I think it's just so cool to see kind of the community at work there and and just that we have the privilege to meet up together and, 
and hang out on a Thursday and play some disc golf. And, you know, the, the scripture says to hold unswervingly. Our discs are not holding unswervingly. I was just <laughs> in the woods getting my disc. But it's so great to, to have people that we can hold unswervingly to our faith together. So, Yeah. Now we're going to pray. Please join us. Dear Father, God, we are so humbled and grateful to be able to be in your presence on, a, on some mountain in West Virginia as we're playing disc golf together. God, we are so thankful to have a community and a church where we can do this with one another, we, where we can go out, hang out on any given day of the week and encourage one another, spur one another on, and hold unswervingly to the faith and good, good works. God, I pray for service. I pray for our hearts, our minds, that we can be soft and open to your word and open to learning and open to your love, God, and that we can really serve one another in the body of Christ, God. Mm -hmm. God, we are so thankful for you. We love you. We love everything you've done for us. And it's in your son Jesus' name we pray. Amen. 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 Sorry, we're experiencing some video difficulty. Hey, good morning. Sorry about that, guys. The uh, For some reason, the video this morning uh, started up incorrectly. Well, good to see everyone. Welcome to the Kanawha Valley Church once again. Uh, it is great to be together, continue on in our study of the book of Hebrews. So if you want to start looking over there, we're going to be in Hebrews chapter 1 today. I'm so excited. We have so much to cover today in this incredibly dense chapter of the book of Hebrews. Uh, thanks to everyone as we turn over. Thanks to everyone who was involved in the Fragment Challenge. I want to thank Sean and Mandy for putting those together. Sean put the uh, the word one together, the fragment sentence one together, and Mandy put the uh, the image one together that we're going to discuss. And thank you to everybody who participated. It was great to see Sharon and Rebecca's uh, uh, submissions in the comments. And uh, thank you to all the kids and everyone who colored. Uh, it's really going to be cool to see how those tie into our chapter today. So we're going to study Hebrews chapter 1. If you look over there, we're going to start reading in verse 1. It says, In the past... God spoke to our ancestors through the prophets at many times and in various ways. But in these last days, he has spoken to us by his son, whom he appointed heir of all things and through whom he also made the universe. The son is the radiance of God's glory and the exact representation of his being, sustaining all things by his powerful word. After he had provided purification for sins, he sat down at the right hand of the majesty in heaven. So he became as much superior to the angels as the name he has inherited is superior to theirs. For to which of the angels did God ever say, you are my son? Today I have become your father. Or again, I will be his father and he will be my son. And again, when God brings his firstborn into the world, he says, let all God's angels worship him. And speaking of the angels, he says, he makes his angels spirits and his servants flames of fire. But about the son, he says, your throne, O God, will last forever and ever. A scepter of justice will be the scepter of your kingdom. You have loved righteousness and hated wickedness. Therefore, God, your God, has set you above your companions by anointing you with the oil of joy. He also says, In the beginning, Lord, you laid the foundations of the earth, and the heavens are the work of your hands. They will perish, but you remain. They will wear out like a garment. You will roll them up like a robe, like a garment. They will be changed, but you remain the same, and your years will never end. To which of the angels did God ever say, 
sit at my right hand until I make your enemies a footstool for your feet. Are not all angels ministering spirits sent to serve those who will inherit salvation? What a great dense chapter we have to look out today. And so as we do, let's, uh, let's say a prayer together. Uh, Father, we come before you having this text before us to study and to exalt Jesus. We, uh, we want unshakable faith, Father. We want to endure whatever storms life throw at us, whatever your will is for us. We want to engage in that and embrace that and live by unshakable faith. And I pray as we begin that journey of studying the book of Hebrews with our eye on that, God, that you would guide us individually, that your spirit would speak to our hearts wherever we are, uh, whatever we need to hear, God, that you would move in each of our hearts individually. And I pray, God, for us as a community of faith that together we can embrace and study this and be guided by your spirit into maturing into Christ through our study of Hebrews chapter one today, God. We love you. We pray all these things in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, well, let's look at three points from this. Point number one, Jesus is greater than the prophets. This chapter is all about Jesus being greater. Remember last week in the introduction, we talked about the, all the greater topics that we're going to study throughout the book of Hebrews. The author does a lot of that, how Jesus is greater than this and greater than that. Today, we're tackling two of those where Jesus has is greater than the prophets and greater than the angels. So how is Jesus greater than the prophets? Now, the prophets are wildly important uh, to our understanding of faith, to the Old, Old Testament, to the Jews. You think about People like Moses, David, Elijah, Elisha, Isaiah. These are towering figures in the Jewish faith. So to say that Jesus is greater than them is no small claim uh, to the Jewish ears that would be listening to this letter. That's kind of a big deal, you know? Um, so why is Jesus greater? You know, when you look back at the prophets, each prophet had uh, a different theme, a little different theme. If you look at Isaiah, the theme of Isaiah is holiness. I mean, it's all about God's holiness and the nations and, and Israel's uh, failure to live up to that. You look at Habakkuk. Habakkuk wrestles with the justice of God. God, why so long? Why are, you know, this is, how can you look at this injustice if you're a just God, right? So that prophet is focusing on injustice. Um, David, man, in the Psalms, you see him, uh, he's focusing on worship, exalting God. Daniel on the judgment of nations and the rise. See, each prophet had a little different theme to what they were revealing about the nature of God. And um, it's a bit like our fragment challenge. And so if you look at the Old Testament and you just look at the prophets, it's kind of like, okay, we have this piece over here, and we have this piece over here, and this piece over here. But exactly how do they fit together? Where do, you know, where do they all go? Which is here? Which is there? And you see how vastly different the, uh, the challenges came in, where you know, the, the stories are completely different. Some people didn't totally understand the assignments when they were trying to do it. And that's a bit like reading the Old Testament. Jesus, though, is the one who came in and said, no, 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 here's the actual story. Here's how it all fits together. Now, we probably should have had a master story that I read right now to contrast how vastly different uh, what people came up with was than the original, but sorry, we, uh, we, we messed that up. Um, but uh, uh, the other fragment challenge that we did uh, really brings this out. Uh, <laughs> um, and so I, I can't, sorry if there's some technical difficulties this morning. I heard that the sound is cutting in and out. Um, apparently we're just going to have to deal with difficulties. I, I don't know how to adjust it at this point in today. So sorry about that guys. Um, but let's look at our, our second challenge was, uh, second fragment challenge was a picture challenge. And you look at the pictures. We gave these two different families to color. And so you look at this picture, just a beautiful picture, colors, hues, different textures. But exactly what is that? And, and what is that, you know, what, what's that going to be? 
Uh, here's another one. Beautiful, bursting colors. The purple, it's radiant, it's awesome. Uh, just really cool. So that's a, that's another picture, but how does that fit into the whole? And we can go through each one, and each one has something special about it. Oh, look at this one. Rainbows and different colors and patterns. Just beautiful. Um, another one, gorgeous, but how does it fit into the whole? And, and so you take all of these, and they're beautiful. Each one individually is, is uh, bursting with color and texture and all these different things, but they really find their significance when you put them all together. And you come up with this. And so you see the whole is understood, uh, or each part is only understood in the whole. And this is how Jesus is greater than the prophets. Jesus is the culmination, the fulfillment, the one who puts it all together, if you would. Before him, it was just each piece individually trying to be understood and trying to be recognized. And what can we understand about God from this? But Jesus is the entirety of it all put together. He is the fulfillment. And so Jesus is the culmination of all of those pieces. If you were to say Jesus was an in or the prophets were an instrument, Jesus is the orchestra. Or if the prophets are a key, Jesus is the whole piano and a, a, a pianist playing the piano. You know what I mean? He's the one who has the prophets all make sense. And so Jesus is superior to the prophets, but not only because his message is greater, but because he is the very message. He's the main message of all the prophets. They all point towards him. He is the message. His person is the message. Every time we hear God the Father in the New Testament, he's talking about Jesus. This is my son whom I love. Um, you know, with him I'm well pleased. This is my son, listen to him. Everything points to Jesus. And so not only is he greater or his, his message greater than the prophets, he is greater because he is the message of the prophets. The person of Jesus is the message of the prophets. So Jesus is superior even to the prophets. Well, let's look at how Jesus is superior to the angels. He is greater than the angels is the claim here. You know, angels were revealed, revered back then uh, by the Jews, particularly because they... Angels were able to be in the presence of God, uh, and humans were not. Um, now, they had reverence in the presence of God, but they were able to at least be in the presence of God. If a human went into the presence of God, they died. And so they understood there's something about these beings that's pretty amazing. And so they were revered. In Luke chapter 1, verse 9, as Gabriel announces um, the birth of Zach uh, the birth of John the Baptist to Zechariah, he says, the angel said to him, I am Gabriel. I stand in the presence of God, and I have been sent to speak to you and tell you this good news. And so that fact alone made the Jews revere angels in a great way. Well, what does the Bible say about angels? You know, it's one of those weird topics. Um, you know, some there's, there's kind of pop culture about it, little babies with wings floating around, that kind of stuff. Um, there's, there was like a period back in the eighties, nineties, when they got really popular, there was the song angels watching over you. And so they've kind of had their run, but by and large, we don't necessarily think or talk about angels a lot on a day to day basis. The angels are mentioned 290 times in the Bible. So they're kind of a big deal. Uh, like uh, they do all kinds of stuff. Psalm chapter, Psalm 103, 20 reads, Praise the Lord, you his only angels, you mighty ones who do his bidding, who obey his word. Angels are powerful spiritual beings. They are, they accomplish, they announce and accomplish the will of God. And you think about, they have some powerful moments in the Bible. The Passover angel who killed all the firstborn in Egypt, who brought the, the wrath of God on that nation. That was an angel. Um, in, in Isaiah, the, the angel that goes out over the Assyrian camp and kills 185,000 Assyrian sh soldiers. These are powerful spiritual beings that are accomplishing God's will to the point where people wrongly worship them. In Colossians chapter 2, verse 18, it talks about um, 
people that begin to worship angels. Uh, and, and it's kind of like, well, how would you do that? But it's kind of funny because John, the apostle, had a situation where he worshiped an angel. In Revelation, as he's receiving the revelation, which is interesting because angels are mentioned 77 times in the book of Revelation. And so if you think about that, 290, there's about 108 in the Old Testament, 112 in the New Testament, or prior to, uh, um, is that the math? 102, 100, whatever it is. Uh, but you got about 100 and 100, and then 80 in, uh, in the book of Revelation. And so it's a massive theme throughout the book of Revelation is the work of angels. Um, but in Revelations 19.10, it says, At this I fell at his, his being the angel's feet, to worship him. But the angel said to me, Don't do that. I'm a fellow servant with you and with your brothers and sisters who hold to the testimony of Jesus. Worship God, for it is the spirit of prophecy who bears testimony to Jesus. And so John was so overwhelmed in the book of Revelation, he fell down and started worshiping an angel. And the angel's like, no, 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 don't do that. And then later on in the book of Revelation, John kind of comically confesses in Revelation 22, 8, he says, I, John, am the one who heard and saw these things. And when I had heard and seen them, I fell down at the feet of the angel who had been showing them to me. So he's kind of like, yeah, this was pretty intense. And I accidentally worshiped an angel and the whole thing. You know what I mean? Kind of a funny admission there in Revelations. But uh, obviously, these are powerful spiritual beings. But these are beings with free will at some level, or not at some level, they have free will. In 1 Peter 4, it talks about how they disobeyed and have been judged by God. Matthew chapter 25, verse 41, it talks about the fires of hell are prepared for the devil and his angels. And so they have a will of whether they are going to do God's bidding or not, and some have fallen. Uh, I don't know if that continues or if that was a one-off kind of thing. The Bible is silent on that, but they have a free will and will be judged. More on that later. Um, and, and according to this passage, these angels in Hebrews chapter 1 are ministers to us. Well, how do they minister us? What are some of the things that we see them doing in the Bible? Okay, um, they, We start seeing them in Genesis chapter 16 when they go to Hagar. Hagar's having a bad time at home. They say, don't worry about it. Go home. You know, you're going to be taken care of. That's the first instance. From that point on, they spend so much time announcing and accomplishing the will of God. Think about Abraham and Lot and Sodom and Gomorrah rescuing Lot and his family in Genesis chapter 18. So much are the instances in Genesis chapter 28. Um, as Jacob is asleep at Bethel, he has the dream. He had a dream in which there was a stairway resting on the earth with its top reaching to the heaven and the angels of God were ascending and descending on it. In other words, it was this idea that God was working and it was the angels that were going up and down and getting the job done. You know what I mean? They're putting in the work, right? And, uh, and so that was the image that he had in Genesis chapter 28. In Exodus chapter 3, we see the burning bush. That was an angel of the Lord that appeared to Moses in the burning bush. And then there's the deliverance, the Passover. But then even as they go into the desert in Exodus chapter 23, it says, See, I'm sending an angel ahead of you to guard you along the way and to bring you to the place I prepared. So while they wandered through the desert, there was an angel ahead of them and behind them that guided them and protected them as they went through the desert. In Job 1 and 2, we see the heavenly staff meeting where all the angels come before God's throne and, and the Satan is there as well. Um, in Daniel, Daniel chapter 3, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, Daniel credits uh, the angel, an angel for rescuing Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. Same in Daniel chapter 6 when he's in the lion's den. Guess who saved him? An angel of the Lord. So all over the place in the Old Testament, all kinds of ways they're serving. Well, how about in the New Testament? In Luke chapter 4, um, well, we, we know about Jesus' birth was announced by Gabriel all over the place. Dreams to Joseph, showing up to Mary and Zechariah. I mean, just all over the place, right? Um, in Luke chapter 4, it's interesting because when Jesus is being tempted by the devil, uh, Satan actually says to Jesus, for it is written, he's quoting Psalm 91, he will command his angels concerning you to guard you carefully. And so Jesus, or Satan is tempting Jesus to take advantage of the ministry of angels. He said, and, and apparently Jesus had such a level of confidence that the angels were going to be there for him that it was kind of tempting. 
Like if you brought me up to the building, top of a building and said, hey, jump off it. God's angels are going to protect you. I'd be like, that's dumb. I ain't doing it. Right. But Jesus apparently had such an understanding that this was tempting to him. He was like, well, maybe he's right. Maybe the angels will catch me. You know what I mean? Like that's a that's a level of sensitivity to the spiritual realm that Jesus had that, to be frank, I don't have. Right. And so you see there that he's tempted. And what's interesting is right after uh, the temptation, what does it say in Matthew chapter four, verse 11? Then the devil left him and the angels came and attended him. And they might have actually brought him food, just like they do to Elijah in in uh, 1 Kings 17, when Elijah's all, woe is me, I'm the only prophet. And the angel comes and brings him some lunch and says, get up and eat. You know, you're not done. He falls back asleep. And then he says, get up and eat again. He provides, brings him some Chick-fil-A. Um, it was the Lord's chicken. All right, what else do angels do? Uh, in Luke chapter 15, uh, it says, in the same way, I tell you, there's more, there's rejoicing in the presence of the angels of God over one sinner who repents. Apparently, angels like to party when people do well spiritually. They like to celebrate and have a good time. Job well done. They're all like, yeah, good job, Gabriel. Good job, Michael. You know, uh, they like to party. Uh, Luke twenty two forty three, an angel from heaven appeared to him and strengthened him. That's Jesus in the garden when he is wrestling with going to the cross, it was an angel that came to him and strengthened him in that time of need to continue to persevere and fight through. This is amazing. In Matthew chapter 28, verse 2, uh, there was a violent earthquake for an angel of the Lord came down from heaven and going to the tomb, he rolled back the stone and sat on it. It was an angel that opened the door for the resurrected Jesus. He was like, let me get the door for you. Right? The angels moved the stone at the resurrection. The angels did not resurrect him, but the angels helped. They opened the door for him. You know what I mean? They let him out. Uh, I don't know how it is to open a tomb from the inside. Never done it. Um, Matthew 13, verse uh, 39, 41, and 49. At the end times, the heart, the the uh, angels are uh, really involved in judgment day and the harvest. Jesus talks often about that. If you're ashamed of me and my words, the Son of Man will be ashamed uh, of you when he comes in his glory and the glory of the holy angels or glory of his father and of the holy angels the angels are really involved in end times activity of judgment day and so we'll see what that looks like well how about in the early church what was going on there Acts chapter 5 verse 19 Peter's in prison angel goes to him and he gets released from prison um, Philip in the desert. It's a, an angel that goes to him and says, hey, go to the desert road and uh, wait there. And then the chariot comes and he preaches to the Ethian eunuch. And so that was at the prompting of an angel. In Acts 10 through 12, the angels are incredibly involved in bringing Peter to Cornelius' house. They give, uh, it's an angel that appears to Cornelius and says, you know, send for Peter. And it's an angel that goes to Peter and says, hey, hey, go with them. And there's all kinds of angels working in that activity to bring about salvation to Gentiles. Um, what else? In Acts chapter 12, Peter is miraculously re released in it for, to Herod, which is interesting because Herod puts, he kills James and see that everybody really likes that. So then he puts Peter in prison and he's getting ready to kill Peter because people seem to like it. Then there's all this political stuff that goes on between Tyre and Sidon and all this stuff. And then he goes before this big group of people and they're all like, oh, you're so awesome, Herod, the political leader. You're like, you're God. And Herod does not say, no, I'm not God. He kind of takes it. He's like, okay, I'll take, I'll take some God encouragement, you know. And God strikes him dead. An angel that strikes him dead. And so there you see, even in politics, angels are at work, right? If politicians take, get big for their britches and claim to be God, angels take them out. Um, okay, so and then uh, in Matthew, I'm sorry, in Acts 27, uh, amidst the storm, an angel appears to Paul and comforts him and tells him that no one's going to die. So you see all kinds of ways still in the New Testament that angels are at work. Hebrews chapter 13 verse 2 actually mentions, Do not forget to show hospitality, strangers, for by so doing, some people show hospitality to angels without knowing it. Some people believe that's referring to Abraham and the three visitors. Uh, saying, look, in the Old Testament that happened. Some people believe that's still going on today, that as we serve people and care for people and take care of people, sometimes it's angels that we're taking care of. And so who am I to say it's either one? I don't know. Again, in Revelation, they're all over the place. They worship, they communicate, they fight spiritual battles in the heavens, they play the gospel. Um, 
And so you see, angels are a huge part of the Bible. And so that was just kind of a survey. We're doing a lot of surveys. That was our angel survey. They're all over the place. Do a study of it. Type angel in your little Bible app and look at some 290 of the verses and get blown away by the activity of angels throughout the scriptures. But the reason the Hebrew author is, begins here is because um, there's a connection between the Mosaic law. In Deuteronomy chapter 33, verse 2 and 3, it reads, the Lord came from Zion and dawned over them from Seir. He shone forth from Mount Paran. He came with myriads of holy ones from the south and from his holy slopes. Surely it is you, loved people. All the holy ones are in your hand. At your feet they all bowed down. And from you they receive instruction, the law that Moses gave us. Um, it became a part of Jewish culture and understanding that on Mount Sinai, Moses, based on this passage, Moses received the Mosaic law from angels. And that's what's echoed in Acts chapter 7 when uh, Stephen is before the Sanhedrin. He says, this is Moses who told the Israelites, God will raise up for you a prophet like me from your own people. He, with angel who spoke to him on Mount Sinai and, our and with our ancestors and he received living words to pass on to us. And then on down verse 52 and 53, he says, and now you have betrayed and murdered Jesus, you who have received the law that was given through angels, but have not obeyed it. And so likely what the writer of Hebrews is doing here is making that connection that, okay, Moses got the law through the angels. Let me show you how Jesus is greater than the angels. And so while angels are amazing, Jesus is far greater. And there's six ways that this passage shows us that Jesus is greater. And I'll go through these quickly. Number one, he has a greater name. Jesus is the son. Angels are messengers. Who's better? The son or the messenger? The son is better, right? So he's great. He has a great name. He has a greater role. Obviously, angels are messengers. Jesus doesn't have, have uh, Jesus isn't just a better message. He is the message. And so he has a greater role. They're the messengers. He is the message. Um, angels actually worship, worship Jesus. Who is greater? The one who worships or the one who gets angels worshipped Jesus? And in fact, that came true in Luke chapter 2. Uh, yeah, 13 and 14, suddenly a company of the heavenly hosts appeared with the angel, praising God and glory to God in the highest, and on earth to those on whom his favor rests. There with the shepherds, announcing to the shepherds, heavens open, holy ho uh, heavenly hosts, angels singing. And so that passage actually found fulfillment in Luke chapter 2, as well as in Revelation chapter 5, where they worship God worthy as the Lamb. It's thousands upon thousands of angels worthy of singing, worthy as the Lamb who stands to receive power and wealth, wisdom and strength and honor. And so angels worship Jesus. Jesus is greater. Angels change. Number four, angels change, but Jesus does not. Okay? Angels change. Jesus does not. Uh, what they're referring to in verse 7 here is that um, in Psalm 104.4, it says, He makes his angel spirits and his servants flames of fire. In some apocalyptic literature, 4th Edris, 8.21 and 22, it's God, whose throne is beyond measure, whose splendor is beyond comprehension, before whom the host of Malachim, Malachim is the Hebrew for angel, before whom the host of Malachim stand with trembling, and at whose command they're changed to wind and fire. This sentiment is also echoed in a rabbinic homily by Yalkut Simoni, where it says, God changes every hour, uh, God changes us, being the angels, every hour. Sometimes he makes us fire and other times wind. What's the point of all this? Nothing changes as fast as fire and wind. If you watch a flame, it flickers all the same with wind. When it starts, it stops, it's here, it's there. Uh, and the idea is there's a, there's not a permanence with angels. They change. Jesus, on the other hand, in Hebrews in 13, Jesus Christ is the same yesterday, today, and forever. Jesus never changes. But not only in their substance or their being, but angels change allegiance. As we talked earlier, the angels made decisions to rebel against God. And one says, and the angels did not keep their position of authority, but abandoned their proper dwelling. These he has kept in darkness, and with everlasting change, for judgment on the great day. And so they not only change their substance, they change their allegiance. They fall like we do. Maybe not as consistently as we do, because all people fall, not all angels fall, but they do, and Jesus never does. And so they're great. Jesus is greater because he does not change. Um, God, angels everlasting, they are not eternal. Now this is an interesting one. In the passage he renunciation, he talks about the heavens will perish, all those kind of things. I have a hard time with this. Simply because at some points it seems like angels are everlasting and at other times it seems like they will perish. And here's what I mean by that. In Luke chapter 20, verse 36, and he's talk, Jesus is talking to the uh, uh, Jewish leaders about marriage and the resurrection and how we're not going to be married anymore because we're going to be like angels. And in verse 36 he says, And they can no longer die, talking to people who have been resurrected, for they are like angels. They are God's children since they're children of the resurrection. And so it seems like angels live on forever. Um, 
But the difference between Jesus and the angels is angels were created. And that's what makes them everlasting. Eternal means no beginning, no end. Everlasting means it just goes on forever. It may have a beginning, but it goes on forever. So angels, while they have, uh, while they are everlasting, they had a beginning. They were created. Jesus has no beginning, no ending. He's eternal. Therefore, he's greater. Um, and lastly, uh, oh, and this is where the riddle came in. The answer was death. Death begins but has no end and ends all that begins. Not at all related to our thing today, just kind of a cool thing that I came with. All right, number six. Lastly, how is Jesus greater? Angels are ministering spirits that minister to Jesus and us. Um, they announce and accomplish God's will as we talked about. Uh, but being the one served is the greater honor. And so angels serve Jesus, the angels serve us. And Psalm 37 says, The angel of the Lord encamps on those who fear him and he delivers them. Matthew chapter 18, verse 10. See, don't despise one of these little ones, talking about Christians. But I tell you that their angels in heaven always see the face of my Father. The idea that we may have angels assigned to us that are looking out for us as followers of Jesus and helping us to uh, accomplish God's will in our life. I'll take that. And then uh, Revelation 21, 20 talks about the angel of the church in different places. It seems like biblically, even our church has an angel. That's pretty cool, right? The KBC angel. We should name it. No, I'm not naming the angel, but that's pretty cool. All right, so these are the ways Jesus is greater, as amazing as angels are, and worthy of our study, worthy of our understanding, worthy of our respect even. Um, they are not greater than Jesus. Jesus is even greater than the angels. That leaves my final point. Jesus has greater glory. In chapter 1, verse 3, it says, Jesus, the Son, is the radiance of God's glory. Now, this idea of glory has stumped me throughout my Christian life. I remember being a, a young campus minister and being asked to preach a, a sermon entitled Glory on John 17. And, and I read it and I'm like, I have no idea what this means. Actually, look over in 17. We're going to read a couple passages from there. Um, and, and really not understanding a lot of the language, a lot of what it means. But I think it's really important for us to understand what this idea of Jesus being the radiance of God's glory means. In John chapter 17, start reading in verse, uh, verse 1. It says, after, after Jesus said this, he looked toward heaven and prayed, Father, the hour has come. Glorify your Son, that your Son may glorify you. For you granted him authority over all people, that he might give eternal life to all those you have given him. Now this is eternal life, that they know you, the only true God, and Jesus Christ, whom you have sent. I have brought you glory on earth by finishing the work you gave me to do. And now, Father, glorify me in your presence with the glory I had with you before the world began. Jump down to verse 20. It says, My prayer is not for them alone. I pray also those who will believe me through their message. All of them be one, Father, just as you are in me and I am in you. May they also be that you have that you gave me, that they may be one as we are one, I in them and you in me, so that they may be brought to complete unity. Then the world will know that you sent me and have loved them even as he has loved me. Father, I want those who have you have given me to be with me where I am. To see my glory, the glory you have given me, because you loved me before the creation of the world. This is like a, a particularly few passage I come on with you. Uh, I've, I've often wondered, like I thought glory was just kind of the the fullness of God's uh, perfect characteristics, and Jesus was the embodiment of that. And certainly that part is true, but there's something a little bit deeper going on here. In this, in verse 1, there's mutual glorification. The Father glorifies the Son, the Son glorifies the Father. And then in verse 2 of chapter 17, God gives the Son authority. He says, you've, you've given me authority that I've made eternal life known. And what is that eternal life? It's a relationship that they may know you, the Father, and me, the Son. Okay. And then in verse 4, Jesus then, so the Son glorified by being given authority, and Jesus glorifies the Father by finishing work that he gave him to do. Okay. So in this, you see a couple things happen. You see uh, sharing of authority, sharing of things, giving to one another, exchange of things. Okay. Then you jump down to, to uh, the 24 passage. In verse 21, he says, Their glory is that they may be one, Father, just as you are in me and I am in you. Okay. This is a kind of a wild thought. It's a theme throughout the Bible um, of God being Jesus, Jesus being God, the Spirit being God, and then Christ being us, us being in Christ and being invited into this, um, what's called perichoresis or uh, the, what it, like what it means is interpenetration, where it's beyond just knowing somebody, it's being in somebody. Another word for it is interpermeation, where it's you, like the two come once. It's a going into. It goes on in verse 22, it says, I've given them the glory you gave me. And verse 23, he repeats it. I in them and you in me so may be brought to complete unity. And so you see this idea of, and in verse 24, he says, I want them to see my glory which you gave me before uh, because you loved me before the creation of the world. And so 
Jesus, the Spirit, and the Father, Jesus, the Spirit, and the Father have had this interpermeation, this relationship going on since before the creation of the world. This is the eternal part, right? And the reign of God's glory is that relationship being revealed to the world, okay? Now, I know it's, it, you can use a lot of time with all the theology of this and all that kind of stuff, but I want to make a, kind of a practical example of it. So perichoresis, this idea of intermingling this relationship between Trinity that we have invited into and powered through to live these Christian lives, this radiance of God's glory that's been revealed to us um, through Jesus' appearing, the message that fills all the prophets, um, it's, it's also uh, uh, equated to a dance. Co a perichoresis, some people say that that chorus or choreography comes from. I know that there's a, a bit of a debate about that Omega, and Omega, whatever. But it's a good image of it being a dance. And it's a dance of surrendering to one another and giving to one another, honoring one another as you serve another, being one, being in together. That, that is the Trinity. And throughout the Bible, you see different aspects of the Trinity coming. It's a bit like when you go to a party and they're dancer. You know what I mean? And then one person jumps in the middle and everyone's like, go so-and-so, go so-and-so. And that's their kind of moment to shine, right? And the whole group giving them their moment to shine, right? And so that's a bit like the paracrease of the Trinity. But first there was God and God's in the circle and he's kind of doing a mysterious dance because he's like, got a little something for you. Oh, got something coming for you. Everyone's like, no, this. and then Jesus is born and it's like, Jesus jumps in the circle. And like, whoa, whoa, right? The mystery revealed, right? And that's the radiance of glory that this is more than just religion. It's Christ in us, Colossians chapter two. And so the salvation through Jesus is revealed. And so the party just goes crazy and the Father is there. Oh, Jesus. And Jesus is doing his thing on earth and he's dying on the cross. And, right? But then it's like there's this breakdown, right? There's this like the music gets real low for a second. And, it's, t -t 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 -t. and then all of a sudden there's this burst and the spirit jumps into the circle, right? And the spirit starts to shine. And that's the age we're in now where spirit has been poured on Pentecost, right? And the Father and Son are just like, go spirit, go spirit. And they're like, you get the spirit and you get the spirit and you get the and Gentiles. Yeah, yeah, you get the spirit. And everybody gets Christ in us, and you can be a part of this dance. And that is the radiance of God's glory that's revealed through Jesus. It was never revealed in prophets. It was never revealed in testament. It wasn't until just his dead on resurrection and the pouring out of the Holy Spirit. Now, I know this is a bit of a crude example. I get it. It's certain the Trinity is not like a dance party with a dance circle. Exactly. But that's what it's talking about. And all these things it talks about, being appointed as heir of all things, that's that's not just a list of things. It's a part of this very career. God said, you are Jesus. You're going to be the heir of all things through whom he made the universe. Again, not just a title. But it's God saying, man, I want through you, I want to make the universe. It's all a part of the relational dynamic of the Trinity, this perichoresis that is now a part of what we are called to. It's the message that we are called to as we live out our Christian life. And so to go back to the religion of Jews made no sense. When you've been invited to the dance party, why go back to the uh, religion of sacrificing animals and following some laws? When you've been invited into the very community, the very divinity of the Trinity, and to be a part of that and that message. And that's what the book of Hebrews is appealing to these people with. He's saying, don't go back to that. What's been revealed to you, the radiance of God's glory through Jesus and his purchasing of that, as it says here, where it says, after you the purification person, he sat down at the right hand of majesty in heaven. Now you've been invited to this dance. Don't go back to religion. That's crazy. Why would you do that? We get to live in community with the Trinity and one another. And that's right to close out today. Um, you know, the question is, are we dancing? <laughs> are you enjoying the fellowship of the Father? As a church, our goal for this year is to be engaged every day, to be engaged with God and your relationship with God, and to be engaged in um, encouraging someone daily. Uh, are we engaged in that? Are you encouraging people daily? You know, because the angels, as it talked about, don't despise any of these little ones. The very next passage after that is, um, you know, if, if there's 100 sheep in the field and one wander away, 99 go after it. I would challenge everybody in the church to reach out to someone you haven't seen in a while. To maybe, you know, maybe not wandering. I'm not saying there's who's wandering, who's not, whatever. But someone you haven't seen in a while. Somebody think, man, that person, maybe they are wandering. I haven't seen them. I haven't heard from them. Let me, let me reach out. Let's all be a part of that ministry of, of taking care of one another. Uh, you know, each week, being midweek and celebrating communion, uh, making sure we're engaging God and one another. This midweek was amazing. It was so much fun. So encouraging to do Old Testament survey and see everybody there. Man, commit to this time together. Engage with one another and continue to be a part of this dance that God has given us. Um, and then to share weekly. Like, this is our chance to share this dance with the world. That's what we're inviting people into. And let's engage in these different challenges we have because we're a part of the dance, because we're at the dance party. Let's rejoice in. Let's not turn to religion let's not turn to all this other stuff let's stay focused on the dance that we have through jesus at this time we're going to pray for communion god thank you so much for the time to study out really these wild incredible topics of angels and perichoresis and this dance that you've invited us to and god thank you so very much 
Thank you most of all the ticket that's been just for us through the purification of sins. We now sit at the, right, the, uh, the right hand of majesty. Father, we are so incredibly grateful for what he's done for us. And I pray that always moves us to join in this dance of love, the love that you have, you have for one another, that we can be a part of, and that through that love, we love one another, take care of each other in a great way, God. Thank you so much for this. We pray all these things in Jesus' name. Amen. What did she have?